Hi, everybody. Um, it is uh, my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Jerome Fabiana. Uh, he's a speaker today. Uh, Jerome did his PhD in statistical physics, in, and I'm going to butcher this. Nice try. Um, yeah, I know it. Um, and then for the past uh, three or four years, it's been a postdoc with uh, Karin Bolson, um, really doing the cutting edge of structural biology and uh, using machine learning applications, not only to understand how to pull the protein, but really to understand interaction between different proteins. And I'm going to leave the stage for him. Thank you very much, Elhanan, for the nice introduction. Um, so uh, today will be an interdisciplinary talk. So, you know, if there is something you do not understand, probably half of the room doesn't understand as well, please stop me if there's, you know, something that is not clear. Um, so I will uh, tell you about uh, machine learning from, for structural biology from function to design. Uh, so, you know, the... Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, working 10 minutes ago. Ah, okay. okay, awesome. What's that? Um, okay, so the focus of the topic today is uh, proteins. So what are proteins? These are macromolecular, um, uh, biological macromolecules that form the basis of life. Proteins do essentially everything in our body. They can transport molecules from one part of our body to another. Uh, let's say hemoglobin that uh, brings oxygen to our cells. They can catalyze reaction like trypsin, which digests our food. Uh, they can uh, protect us from pathogens like antibodies that recognize them and bind them uh, and eventually neutralize them. So, you know, there's like all sorts of uh, very, a huge diversity of functions that protein, proteins carry out in our body. And this is somewhat uh, fascinating because uh, proteins are only made up from uh, a handful of building blocks, uh, namely amino acids. So uh, amino acids are organic molecules, like these ones that I show you here. These are the molecular graphs for each of them. So it's a class of molecules that is defined by a shared backbone. So this is a amine group, a carboxyl group over there, and a carbon atom. You can see it's the same for all of the amino acids. And then a side chain, which is variable, that I circle here in green. So uh, there are essentially uh, 20 uh, amino acids that are the most commonly found among proteins. And these can actually um, fuse together, polymerize to form this sort of uh, very long polypeptide chain that we call proteins when we're talking about like 30 or more amino acids. So, um, this is the molecular graph representation, which is a bit uh, busy in a way. So you can uh, simplify it by just specifying which side chain is at each position, right? So you have 20 types of amino acids. You can define a single letter for uh, every amino acid. And then, you know, a protein would be defined by a sequence, like just a string of letters. After uh, synthesis of a protein, it will typically uh, fold into a three-dimensional structure. This is a process that is governed by uh, physical interactions, like these amino acids, they would tend to uh, have uh, non-covalent interactions with one another. Let's say uh, positively charged amino acid would uh, attract uh, negatively charged amino acids, uh, and so on and so forth. And this will lead to uh, of, like a folding of this you know, um, polymer into uh, this three-dimensional structure. And this 3D structure will typically provide a protein of interest with a well-defined function. Uh, let's say in this case, it will have a very nice shape that nicely complements a certain uh, over uh, bio biological molecule, and it will bind to it with high affinity and recognize it with high specificity. So uh, as some of you may know, uh, there has been a tremendous progress uh, started by machine learning in prediction of protein structure from sequence. Uh, you know, the celebrated alpha pole algorithms, and there are other algorithms uh, like this by now. Uh, which enables structure prediction from sequence at scale. So um, 
basically now it's very easy to get access to a structural model with you know some quality sometimes good sometimes not but, and we have like hundreds of millions of such protein structures but ultimately what we care about is function we want to understand what these proteins do basically so let's say if we uh, take an enzyme we would like to understand uh, which actual chemical reaction is catalyzed if we take uh, an antigen we want to uh, an antibody sorry we want to understand which pathogen is recognized and if we want and we in general you can ask um, how come proteins can recognize one another so this is uh, a graph a, a graphical representation of a human protein protein interactome we have about uh, 20000 proteins and um, in principle you know any protein could interact with any other protein but in practice the interaction graph is actually very sparse something like uh, 700,000 interactions, in, uh, which is much smaller than, you know, 20,000 to the square. So somehow these recognition processes are very specific and we don't have a very good predictive power over this. So these are things we would like to understand. And, you know, the general question is, could we also use machine learning to predict function from uh, structure? So uh, today we'll describe uh, two of my recent works. Uh, the first will be ScanMet, a geometric deep learning model for uh, structure-based functional site annotation. This is a joint work with Chaim here and uh, Dinesh Meinman who host me, host me in Jerusalem. And uh, the second work, but uh, you know, it will be the majority of the talk and I will briefly describe a second work uh, which is based on sequence. Uh, sequence generative models that uh, enable reverse engineering of function from uh, sets of sequences. So this is a uh, joint work again with a lab of Chaim and with uh, the experimental lab of Marianne Gann, who is here at the School of Dentistry. Okay, um, so uh, let's talk first about, uh, you know, what are the classical ways to predict function from structure? So one of them is so-called comparative modeling approaches. The idea is very simple. In blue here, you have a query protein uh, and you want to understand, you know, its structure, but not its function. And in, uh, over here, there's a, like a set of uh, template proteins about which you know both the structure and function. So uh, the sort of simplest thing you can think of is to try to compare them in a pairwise manner. Look for the one that best match the, the template that best matches your query, and then um, deduct function based on this. So let's say in this case, uh, our query looks a lot like a tin barrel, and like tin barrels are like proteins that are known to be enzymes, and therefore I can sort of deduce that this is an enzyme. So uh, this is one way. You can uh, also perform this comparison at the substructural level, uh, meaning that you can look for substructural motif, like these ones over here, uh, that are, uh, again, um, of which their function is known. So let's say, for instance, over there, let me try to. No. Okay, never mind. I'll talk about the one in the middle. Uh, so let's say this is an EFN, which is a known motif a substructure that tends to bind calcium ions. So I'm going to try to find this, uh, these motifs within my protein structure of interest. And based on this, I can induct function. So, you know, in this case, I will find a zinc finger, which is a protein that a uh, motif, sorry, that is associated with uh, binding to a DNA and RNA, and therefore I can deduce that this protein binds to DNA and RNA. From the point of view of machine learning, uh, it's good to think of these algorithms as the sort of the k-nearest neighbors of structural biology. And this uh, helps you understanding the uh, you know, advantages of shortcomings. And the short their shortcomings are that, in general, the coverage can be low. Like, you know, for uh, any given protein, query protein, it's not clear that I have something similar uh, with a known functionality. There's also a question of similarity metric, which similarity metric I should use to compare uh, these different kinds of protein folds. And uh, there is a sequence sensitivity problem as well, which is that uh, by definition, these methods will not be sensitive to small changes in the input, like say a few mutations. But we know that function can drastically change when we perform a few mutations, like for instance, a viral antigen, a protein can uh, completely es escape binding by antibodies just by performing a few mutations. So uh, these are like typical problems with comparative modeling approaches. 
another uh, class of methods are uh, so-called feature-based analysis. Uh, the idea is the following. Starting from a, a given structure of interest, they will calculate uh, multiple features of, let's say, uh, geometric nature. So uh, let's say the, I could look at the molecular surface and calculate the, uh, for every point the, whether the local curvature of the surface. And I, I could also look at, let's say, uh, solvent accessibility, which is a measure that quantifies for a given amino acid whether it's exposed to water molecules or not. And uh, so these are like one class of features. I can also complement them with uh, physical chemical features like electrostatic potential, which um, quantifies how much uh, charged particle will be attracted or repelled uh, by the protein at a local resolution or uh, hydrophob hydrophobicity um, scales, which uh, quantify how much uh, two proteins like to bind to, together. So I could, you know, use all of these features to, first of all, just, you know, look at the protein structure and trying to make uh, qualitative deduction, or I can also combine them um, and into predictive pipeline using feature-based machine learning. So think of it as like decision trees and so on, uh, that I calculated on top of these features. The problem uh, of feature-based machine learning, which is, you know, very generic across all domains of science is uh, an expressivity problem. It's always, um, it's not always clear whether these features can capture the entire uh, diversity of inputs and, uh, and therefore can, they can underfit data of interest. So um, what about deep learning? Well, uh, it's a potentially a very nice solution, right? But you have to, uh, find a correct representation for these protein structures, and it's not trivial. So let's say uh, one option would be to use a voxel-based representation. Uh, given my protein structure, I will define a grid and uh, you know uh, define occupancy levels for every single of these voxels, and I could combine this representation with convolutional neural networks, uh, classical ones. So it's very nice because we know that we will have a local processing of a structure. We can try to search for these structural motifs. We have this nice translation of variance property of convolutional neural networks. But there's uh, no rotation invariance. And in 3D, it's a big problem. Uh, in 2D, there's only one parameter rotation. But in 3D, we're talking about three parameters already. And it's also very memory intensive. So you know it's not a silver bullet. Another option is to. Uh, um, look at the raw data format, which is uh, that of a point cloud. Uh, there have been works in the field of three divisions that deal with this sort of point cloud based uh, scenes uh, like LIDAR data set. And there have been uh, works uh, that, uh, you know, devise neural networks architecture tailored for this data. Uh, so it's nice because they handle uh, the sparsity uh, very nicely, but um, it's not completely clear whether it will work well because Unlike a natural scene, uh, let's say uh, 3D uh, point cloud sampling of you know, uh, this uh, seminar room here, uh, a natural scene will have a, you know, a canonical orientation, right? You know, we are not upside down. But uh, for a protein structure, there's absolutely no canonical orientation. So whatever algorithm we use must be really you know, mathematically invariant to translation and rotation. And this is not always the case. Uh, locality is another problem because we know that let's say uh, the global shape of a shell defines the nature of the object, but for proteins again sometimes it's these you know local motifs that define function. Um, and also another point which is important is that a generic point cloud is uh, invariant to permutation. You can switch the order of your uh, points in your point cloud and it's the same physical object. But for proteins, well, we know that there are, let's say, covalent bonds between them. So, you know, I could go on. Uh, uh, what about graph neural networks, let's say? So, uh, in principle, you can define a graph uh, for a protein structure by taking, let's say, for every node as an amino acid and defining edges between uh, neighboring amino acids. So, this is nice. You have locality, you have a translation and rotation invariance, but it's not so trivial to scale up at the atomic scale. And in general, there's also an interpretability issue. It's not completely clear whether these net what these networks learn and uh, whether they can learn, let's say, high order arrangements of uh, amino acids. So, you know, 
I think the conclusion of this slide is that um, there is no silver bullet. It's not completely clear what we should use. And perhaps the solution is to try to define a neural network architecture that is tailored for protein structures. And this is what I'm going to try to show you today. So, yes. In some the same slide we talk about computer vision, right? So I can do it at a big level, like a fine feature, like a try to have a 3D image. So, 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 okay. so, so how is this different than trying to learn from picture or computer vision? So, you know, I, I believe the answer is the symmetries are different. Like protein structures have their own symmetries and they have their own, um, let's say, uh, scales, they have their own edges. So, at the end of the day, it's hard to encode a protein structure in a classical data representation. That would be my answer. So, uh, yes. What about using the, the raw um, representation of the protein, like the, the sequence that you showed earlier? The sequence? Presumably, um, predicting structure might be harder than predicting the, right, the function that you're trying to do. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a very good question. So there are people who try to sidestep structure altogether using, let's say, uh, transformer models. Or uh, I believe that there's two reasons for that. One of them is not such a good reason that people are more used to NLP. Uh, you know, it's a very, it's always the same data format where the protein structures are peculiar. It's, you know, one reason. But like in general, uh, structure conveys a lot of information. Let's say if I want to understand whether a protein structure is an, a protein is an enzyme or not, it's actually quite easy to look at, at it, at, you know, at the actual protein structure. And then, you know, I can find, let's say, a cavity in the molecular surface. And that is a very strong indicator that it is an enzyme. But from sequence, that would be very hard. So I would anticipate that a sequence-based model would be perhaps performant, but that's not clear, and, and for sure not very interpretable. Okay, so, so moving on to, you know, supposing that we would like to define such a network that is tailored for protein structures, what are we looking for? Uh, so first of all, end-to-end -end differentiability, uh, because we want to like discover the structural motifs. We want to understand what are the uh, you know, the, the edge detectors of protein structures, that's one. And also we're interested in design applications as well. So we want to be able to predict the um, change in, in function that arise from, let's like, say, a single point mutation uh, just by computing a gradient. We want to understand, uh, to have a model that is, of course, invariant to translations and rotations, wouldn't depend on, you know, the orientation of the protein structure. Uh, it's also important that uh, processing is local and multi-scale. We know that there is information that is relevant at the atomic scale, some of it at the amino acid scale, and some of it at like a larger scale. We want to be able to integrate additional data modalities, let's say evolutionary data, which can more or less tell you in advance, uh, let's say, uh, that some amino acids are more important than others for function. And we would like to be able to integrate this data. Uh, the sort of... Um, Test of validity will be that, of course, our network works well, like in terms of performance, but also, you know, just like a convolutional neural network on images will find GABA filters, we would like our network to be able to recover uh, known features of protein structure. And this will be like a very strong test. As a bonus, we would like to have it to be, you know, uh, fast enough, uh, interpretable, interpretable, sorry, and uh, robust to small motions. So uh, we devise uh, an architecture that uh, addresses all of these criteria, which we call SCANET. SCANET stands for Spatial Chemical Arrangement of uh, Neighbor Networks. So the idea is the following. Starting from a protein structure, we'll first uh, look at the, an atom and we would uh, extract an atomic neighborhood. And, or, and, and you, know, you define a local frame around it. Then we... Um, Convolve this local point cloud with a set of trainable spatial chemical filters that will look for you know, specific patterns. And this will give us uh, an atomic scale representation. So you know, a vector of entries for every single atom. The next step is to pull this uh, information at the amino acid scale and uh, repeat the process. 
now we extract an amino acid, uh, neighborhood at the amino acid scale level. We again convolve it with trainable spatial chemical filter, and we obtain an amino acid scale representation that we can now use for uh, like any downstream prediction task that you can think of. So um, diving in into specific modules. So one of the first is the neighborhood computation module that takes in, as input that a list of atom coordinates for every single atom of a protein structure and the corresponding covalent bonds and the attributes, let's say what kind of atom is it? And the output will be, uh, you know, around every atom, uh, local coordinates of the K nearest neighbors and the, the corresponding attributes. The key ingredient here is to define a local frame that using the orientation of the covalent bonds. Uh, by doing so, you have uh, local coordinates that are invariant upon translation and rotation of your input. Um, the second module is uh, this neighborhood embedding module, which takes as input a local point cloud and produces like a vector based representation. So uh, we implemented it as follows uh, in three steps. Uh, basically, the first step is to apply a Gaussian embedding to the coordinates to basically discretize space. The second step is to calculate a bilinear product of the uh, space representation here, uh, written as G, and the attributes uh, of every atom. So this would be a computation for a single atom. And then we would you know, sum the, over the contribution of all the atoms in the neighborhood and apply uh, any nonlinearity. It's a rectified linear unit. So um, what's the idea? Uh, well, in principle, any, you know, uh, any additive function would do it, right? Uh, Multilayer perception would work as well. But uh, the nice thing over here is that there's a very clear interpretation of these uh, tensors uh, over here. So let's say if a filter has a single entry uh, that is non-zero for this, let's say we, you know, for the Gaussian of the middle and for, let's say, uh, the carbon atom in terms of attribute, then it means that the filter will be activated whenever the neighborhood has a carbon atom, atom in the center. In general, you can have uh, many component, components that are non-zero in this tensor, but we will actually apply uh, sparsity regularization on these weights to enforce that our filters have only a few components. Uh, there's two reasons. One of them is interpretability. We want to be able to look at the outcome of the learning. And the second one is uh, parsimony. So we know that these structural motifs we are looking for, uh, actually only um, in these motifs, actually a handful of atoms or a handful of amino acid matter. So, you know, having uh, filters that are sort of local in space, uh, in space and chemistry actually makes a lot of sense. Uh, finally, uh, we have uh, this uh, pooling operation that takes information uh, at the atomic level and puts it at the amino acid scale level. So, you know, we know uh, for every atom to which amino acid it belongs. Uh, so in principle, any uh, classical pooling operation could do it, right? Maximum pooling, average pooling, and so on and so forth. But uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, actually um, atoms are not permutation invariant. They don't have a, play a, an identical role within amino acid. So let's say, for instance, uh, it could be interesting to calculate uh, the solvent accessibility of the side chain atoms and the solvent accessibility of the backbone atoms in two different channels. So in order to do that, you need something more expressive than a, than a symmetrical pooling operation. So we actually use the uh, an attention mechanism, which basically has performs a weighted average of the atomic level representation with trainable weights. Okay, so, you know, uh, this is how the uh, architecture looks like. You can, you know, convince yourself that it satisfies all of these criteria. It also turns out that it's very fast because it only looks at a local neighborhood and it's based on this sparse point cloud representation. Uh, moving on to uh, a few applications. So, uh, I'm first going to, yes? Okay. I thought you were interested in some hierarchy of this. It seems that you started the amino acid method. Yes, there's a third layer I didn't mention, which uh, takes, uh, you know, aggregates information at a um, coarser scale a little bit, uh, but it's uh, it, it's somewhat application specific. Uh, so, so in principle, you can have, let's say, um, first of all, you can iterate, right, using a larger amino acid neighborhood. You can repeat the exact same process. 
take another, like, you know, another neighborhood of amino acids. Uh, let's say, uh, instead of taking the 16 clauses, you can take the 64 clauses, let's say. And that what, what you obtain is, you know, a broader <laughs> neighborhood. And you can aggregate the information at, at this scale as well. Okay. Okay. Because without it, it seems that what we did without mentioning this extra layer could more or less be achieved with a graph based representation of the amino acids. Agreed. Correct? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. So let's say if we look at this, uh, you know, neighborhood embedding module over here, again, you could encode something, you know, if you define as uh, if you define a, a graph with you know sparse edges and you know the core and vector valued edges with local coordinates uh, for each edge, then you know let's say a message space neural network would be basically the same formula but replacing replacing this you know bilinear product with a multilayer perceptron. It's the same thing, but it's a different inductive bias, right? Because uh, the regularization is different. Uh, let's say with a multilayer perceptron. You cannot be sure, let's say, that it has finite support. But if I, there is an atom that is very far away, but ends up in my neighborhood because my point is isolated, then with a multilayer multilayer perceptron, maybe it will have a very large activation. Whereas with you know, if you use Gaussian canals over here, you have like you know mathematical uh, warranty that you have finite support. Um, okay. So uh, describing uh, applications. So one of the most simple functional sites in proteins are protein-protein binding sites. Uh, so uh, proteins, you know, they recognize one another, they interact with one another. This is an example of complex between an enzyme, which is shown in molecular representation here in green, in yellow, and its inhibitor shown in green. So they would form a complex uh, that would, you know, prevent the enzyme from being active uh, under certain cellular condition. So you can see that uh, only a handful of amino acids are actually involved in the interaction. They are shown in red. And my question is the following. Uh, suppose that I forget about the partner and I, I only know the structure of this you know, uh, single protein. I want to, to predict these protein-protein binding sites uh, just from the structure. Uh, so mathematically, it's just a segmentation problem over the protein structure. Uh, it's important to point out that it's like not a trivial problem at all. Like it's ha very hard to do by eye. Um, so, uh, you know, we took our network, we devised a data set uh, by, you know, uh, doing what I just showed you before. We took, uh, uh, we looked at pub publicly available protein complexes. We defined the binding sites using the complex and then, you know, we split them apart in two pieces. And um, this is, you know, we would use these labels as our target for our learning problem. So the data set we can devise with, with these methods are actually pretty small. It's about you know twenty thousand uh, protein chains. Um, but you know apart from this, you know it's very similar. You would train your network by uh, binary cross entropy minimization. Uh, the learn, it's actually fairly the network is actually fairly efficient between one or two hours, one to two hours of training on a you know uh, good uh, NVIDIA GPU that we have here at Tel Aviv. And uh, for evalu evaluation, we can use precision recall curves. There is a catch, and the catch is that uh, proteins are not um, independent, identically distributed samples from uh, an underlying probability distribution. Uh, the reason is the following. Proteins are evolutionarily related. Sometimes you can have two proteins that have you know, uh, a common ancestor very, uh, in not very remote away in time, so they have a very high sequence identity. And you can have others that are very divergent. So in general, the, stru the structural coverage is non-uniform, and it's, you have you know different degrees of homology between proteins. And it's very very important to assess the generalization of your network across these degrees. So what we did was to uh, stratify basically our test set based on the degree of homology of you know a given test set example to its closest counterpart in the training set. And we define four such degrees and we evaluate the performance of our model uh, in every four of these subsets. So in the high similarity regime, what you find is that, you know, the network does well, but it doesn't do as well as a baseline on, based on comparative modeling. This makes sense. Like if there's something very similar in your training set, just doing a pairwise comparison will give you very good results. However, as you uh, reduce the degree of homology, we will find that 
um, the network does much better than homology modeling. Uh, and uh, also it does much better than a baseline based on encrafted features uh, with, let's say, uh, XGBoost, uh, bo any gradient boosting algorithm. Um, in terms of um, what the actual network learns, well, because we've uh, applied this sparse penalty regularization, we can actually look at uh, the filters done by the model and they are actually interpretable and also meaningful. So this is a really visualization of one filter learned. Uh, and what you see are basically the components that are non-zero in this you know, uh, tensor matrix over here. So basically this filter on the left detects a nitrogen group uh, in the center and an oxygen group that is away from its covalent bonds over here. Uh, so this is like a, an example of neighborhood that would activate here, and you can see the two components there. Um, what's the idea? Well, this is actually a nitrogen bond. A nitrogen bond is like a, common, a pattern that is very commonly found in protein structures. Again, you can think of it as like the edges of a protein structure. Um, and then you can have uh, patterns that are more complex and that involve multiple components, uh, but you can make sense of them. So this one has uh, two components in the, uh, in the center, like a sulfur atom over here and a methyl group that is uh, covalently bounded to it. So, you know, you can trust me on this one. This is actually a filter that detects uh, the tip of a methionine side chain. It's not uh, trivial, but this is what it is. And then the uh, other component that is very interesting is this one, which is comes from actually this term in the sum, which is, um, sensitivity to coordinate, but not to attribute. So, you know, it's written any, but in reverse, it means that there's a negative co coefficient over here. Whenever there is an atom in this region, the filter will be inactive. What this means is that the filter detects methionine side chains that are exposed to the water solvent, that are not buried. Um, okay, and you can do the same at the amino acid scale level and you would find uh, interesting filters. Another interesting thing is that, you know, the network uh, representation actually captures uh, many uh, interesting and crafted features. So, for instance, this is a TSNE, pro TSNE projection of the atomic scale representation. And so, you know, every point will be an atom in an uh, ensemble, a set of uh, validation structures. And the coloring is based on the electrostatic potential. So what you can see is that, you know, uh, Atoms with different values of electrostatic potential basically segregate nicely in this representation space, which means informally that the representation captures electrostatic potential. It's not trivial at all, because actually to calculate electrostatic potential, you have to solve a partial differential equation, uh, the Poisson-Boltzmann equation. So, you know, it's really not obvious that you can approximate it using the neural network and without any supervision. You can look at the same, you can have the same story uh, at the amino acid scale representation, and you would find, let's say, that um, uh, amino acids that are buried are segregated from amino acids that are uh, exposed to the solvent molecules. Uh, moving on to another application, uh, which is a prediction of antibody binding site. Um, so this here is the receptor binding domain of the spike protein of the coronavirus. Uh, this is a you know a picture of the coronavirus. The spike protein is the protein shown in red, and the receptor binding domain is basically the part that is on the tip of the protein. It turns out that uh, this receptor binding domain is the main target of antibodies uh, uh, that our body produces against the coronavirus. So um, what I'm going to show here are structures of antibody uh, of complexes between the receptor binding domain and uh, human antibodies uh, that have been characterized over the last uh, you know two and a half years uh, as you show more and more on this uh, what you find is that they have uh, these antibodies have preferences they tend to target some binding sites with uh, you know uh, higher at higher frequencies than others so you know you can in case for, for you know antigens that have been uh, studied a lot, like the, receptor, the spike protein, you can actually calculate these maps that would quantify you know, the frequency of being targeted by an antibody for a, at the amino acid scale level. Again, you can see that this is very heterogeneous and the question is, could we predict it on structure? So mathematically, it's a, again, it's the same thing, right? It's a, if you, you know, think of a, 
of it as a binding site, it's a segmentation problem. So a residue, an amino acid level prediction task. Um, so we can do exactly the same thing, uh, which is you know devise a, da a data set by splitting antibody antigen complexes from uh, available from public databases and predict train a network by cross entropy minimization. In this case, because we don't have a lot of data, you can actually use transfer learning. So because protein-protein binding sites are related to antibody binding sites, uh, um, uh, transfer learning makes a lot of sense. And again, we'd find that uh, the network does much better than uh, baseline based on structural homology or baseline based on handcrafted features. Uh, this is a small application to uh, predicting the uh, epitopes of the whole spike protein. Uh, so, you know, uh, crystallizing these antibody antigen complexes is actually very uh, work intensive. It's, it takes a lot of time and effort. So here, using the network, you can actually predict for every single amino acid of a protein, uh, whether they are likely or not to be targeted by antibodies. Uh, so this is shown in color scale, where the blue would correspond to high probability of being bound by antibodies and white to low probability. You can see that, let's say, uh, the receptor that binding domain, which is again the main target of antibodies, has a high probability, uh, as well as others that are known to be targeted, like the N terminal domain or uh, this uh, conserved uh, region along the stem of the spike protein. Now, um, because we have a sense, the network is sensitive to the sequence, to the actual sequence of the model. Of, of, the, of the protein we are looking into, you can actually um, investigate the impact of mutations on the prediction. So this is what we did. We calculated the antibi antibody binding probability profile for the original strain of a coronavirus uh, using ScanNet. And then we did exactly the same thing for all known variants of concern. And we calculated the differences. What we found was that um, for the initial variants, which do not have a lot of mutations, uh, there is very little changes. This plot shows you uh, the difference in antibody binding probability compared to the wildcat. So, you know, uh, zero would be the wildcat. And, uh, uh, you know, as you go up in this axis or low in this axis, below in this axis, you have a very more significant changes. However, for the Omicron variant, uh, which has 15 mutations, uh, we found a significant decrease. In, an, in antibody binding probability. And this decrease was concentrated in the region that binds the human AC2 receptor and enables the penetration of a protein and the virus into the human cell. Uh, so, you know, this is how it looks like in three dimension. And, you know, if you recall the plot I showed you before, there is a very uh, suspicious correlation. Uh, what this means is that the mutations are the, the changes are the most important in regions that are targeted the most by antibodies. So it makes a lot of sense from the point of view of a virus, right? It tries to escape uh, uh, antibodies uh, in the most critical regions. So, uh, you know, we were very excited about all these findings and we uh, discussed with, with uh, experimental collaborators of DINA who work in uh, Mount Sinai and University of Pittsburgh. And, uh, you know, they were convinced and they decided to test this prediction. So they immunized mice uh, against um, all uh, multiple variants of the receptor binding domain. And then uh, after immunization, so vaccination basically, they collected the serum and they tested its ability to you know, protect against infection. What they found was that uh, there was a basically 15 fold reduction in the uh, so-called antibody, antibody titers of uh, the Omicron variant compared to um, the wild type. I also um, have, uh, they also showed something which is very uh, you know, surprising. If you immunize a mice against the wild type, the Wuhan strain, it would protect you better against Omicron than you if you immunize a mice against Omicron, uh, which is uh, very counterintuitive and, you know, there is actually a connection with, uh, you know, what people tried afterwards, like the original Omicron mRNA vaccine actually failed. And this, we think this is connected. So, um, okay, so, you know, this is very uh, exciting. Uh, could we use these, me these methods to 
predict future variants, like mutations that have a strong impact on immunity. Uh, so in principle, at least computationally, it's possible. You can calculate for every single amino acid mutation uh, the impact on antibody binding propensity. This is shown by this sort of uh, virtual deep mutational scan plots over here. Uh, so you would find mutations that would further reduce uh, the propensity to be bound by antibodies. However, uh, viral fitness is uh, actually very multifactorial. You need also to maintain, let's say, the stability of your protein. It, do, it doesn't, it shouldn't be like the mutation shouldn't break it, right? It should also um, uh, still bind the human AC2 receptor to enable entry into the cell. And then like there's, you know, tons and tons of other criteria, like, you know, we're not done, right? It should also invade other components of the immune system. It should uh, not bind other uh, proteins because you don't want the virus to get lost and, and so on and so forth. So there's like a long list of uh, factors that need to be taken into account. So the answer to can we forecast uh, future variants is uh, it's complicated. Okay. But, uh, you know, it's something that we're interested in too. And, you know, we, can, we hope we can better understand uh, evolution using these sorts of models. So, um, okay, so with the time, short time that remains, I want to tell you about a second project, which is a sequence generative model for reverse, reverse engineering of function from sequence. So, you know, um, now we're talking about sequence-based models uh, without uh, dealing with structure altogether. The idea is the following. Uh, usually when we have, you know, when I show you this plot that takes a sequence and turns it into uh, structure and eventually function, well, we don't have a single sequence actually. We have many such sequences because every organism typically have proteins that perform related function and would be, uh, you know, and you can have, so you would have a variant for human, for rats uh, and so on. And you can also have also gene duplication. So a protein that appears twice in the genome. So this uh, diversity of sequences is actually interesting because it is related to uh, the so-called fitness function. Uh, so what do I mean by this? The fitness function is like a sort of abstract uh, quantification of how well a protein carries out its function. So you can think of it as, you know, uh, you have a sequence space, which is, uh, you know, a, a combinatorial space of all possible strings of length L with, you know, these 20 types of letters. And you have this like sort of abstract fitness function that can take high or low value uh, based on whether the protein is functional or not. The idea is the following. Everything that you see by definition has a high fitness function because otherwise, you know, basically the organism doesn't survive or something happens, it gets washed away by evolution. So this is like sort of a weak signal that tells you, uh, provides you with information related to fitness function. So how can we use it? Well, another function that takes large value for observed samples and low values for unobserved samples is a probability distribution, right? A probability distribution that you would fit on these multiple sequence alignments. And you would find that, you know, it would somewhat overlap, uh, correlate with uh, the actual fitness function. Uh, so, of course, uh, it's not clear whether this is what you should fit or, you know, something much more rough. It's not clear whether it can extrapolate, right, in the sequence space. But in a way, it's a learning problem, right, a classical learning problem. So, um, the question is, how can you define, uh, like, a smooth inductive bias for learning probability distribution of our discrete spaces? And the answer is, it's possible. So, you have to look at what matters in these alignments. So one of these would be, let's say, conservation patterns where uh, for a given position along the protein, it would be almost always the same amino acid. You can have uh, co-evolution uh, co patterns. So basically patterns of um, correlated or anti-correlated mutation. And this can arise from structure, let's say, uh, if two amino acids are next to one another, then they cannot have the same charge. Otherwise, they repel each other and it breaks down the structure. And you can also have, you know, uh, these high order coevolution patterns that arise, let's say, uh, when you have two different types of, um, you know, molecules that are recognized, and therefore you would have like uh, groups of amino acids that mutate together to accommodate different ligands. So, you know, um, I, we came up during my PhD with like uh, one such function that could 
um, you know, model accurately these uh, multiple sequence alignments, which is based on restricted Boltzmann machines. Uh, I don't have much time to explain, but the idea is the following. You have a closed form equation for the likelihood, which contains two kinds of terms. One of them has these uh, field terms that basically model the single site frequency. So basically, they can capture these conservation patterns. And then you have these um, effective potential terms that arise from shared input between uh, different variables and that can account for correlation, basically, a bit of your data. So, um, okay. Um, the trick is, let's say, if this uh, potential gamma mu is quadratic, you can see that what you obtain, and you have to maybe, maybe it's too much for, you know, two minutes before the end of the talk, but uh, you obtain something that looks like a pairwise uh, POTS model. And in general, you can uh, generalize to it. So, you know, very quickly, um, an application for uh, peptide design for therapy. So we, uh, this is an enzyme called calcinerin, uh, which is uh, involved in multiple health and disease pathways, uh, such as uh, activation of the immune system, basically. So the way it works is that it recognizes its substrates by a, a conserved region over here, uh, so-called sequence motif, and, and then they would be, uh, the enzyme would produce, uh, trigger the reaction. So what we want is to design peptides, so small proteins that would bind over here and basically block interaction with other proteins. So to do this, we basically, uh, we will basically take an alignment of the regions that bind this protein in regular proteins uh, and regular substrates and train a model on this. So this is how it looks, the pipeline looks like in two worlds. From this alignment of, of binding fragments, we will apply a sequence generated model that uh, from which we will then sample from, generate new peptides that we can screen using structural methods or uh, medium throughput assay, and eventually like low throughput experiments. So this is joint work with the labs of Mayan Gal and again, Chaim. So in, in two worlds, what we found was we, we tested some of them in the lab and they worked, right? So we found two things that uh, are exciting to us. A, um, peptides that uh, are, you know, bind tighter than or positive controls for experiments and B sequences that have that bind very well and yet are um, very far away from any known sequence. This means that basically you have uh, your generative model learn to extrapolate well in the sequence space. Okay, so wrapping up, uh, we have, um, so, you know, the take home message messages. Uh, protein function prediction is a central and you know multifaceted problem at the heart of modern structural biology. We uh, devised a geometric deep learning model for learning representations of protein structures that are uh, meaningful for you know any kind of downstream function prediction task. And also, you know, we have published a paper. We have a web server as well. And we, uh, in cases where there is no structure or it's not completely clear what should be the function to be predicted. Uh, you can use uh, also a sequence model based on uh, evolutionary data um, to, you know, uh, predict function or even design uh, new proteins. I would like to argue that this is controversial, but in general, protein data benefits from inductive biases that are tailored to proteins. Uh, you know, I don't know if I have convinced you today, but you know, this is a personal opinion. Uh, so, so what's next? Um, one of them would be uh, to generalize and build upon a work that like predict broader classes of functions. Uh, so let's say for a given enzyme, which reaction is catalyzed uh, for a given protein, where is it located in the cell and so on and so forth. We, the ultimate goal would be to apply these tools to screen these large databases of protein structures, trying to find function, uh, proteins of biote biotechnological interest. And, and then uh, another um, application would be to, you know, move away from supervised machine learning and try to use, apply a self-supervised method to learn basically good representation of protein structures. You know, you can call them foundation models or whatever. Um, you know, we also want to uh, predict uh, interactions, uh, like extend this binding site prediction to be partner specific. Uh, let's say for design, predicting protein peptide interactions and applying them to uh, peptide design protocols. 
and uh, we would like also to uh, use these models use these models to study viral evolution uh, basically trying to understand what are the determinants what you know drives mutation so you know with that i would like uh, to thank uh, first of all Chaim for hosting me here uh, and Dina for hosting me uh, in Jerusalem, uh, my uh, collaborators, uh, my funding agencies, which is HFSP and also the CERFA Center, the invitation, and you know, all of you for your attention. Yes. So, in a sense, you were arguing for inductive bias and uh, these. Uh, this architecture you devise an architecture and I, I think you realize that in some sense there is like the trend of like having less architecture that because as you have more architectures it's hard to maintain and it's not necessarily always scalable and people are working on that kind of problems and like the other kind of like the possibility would be you know like what you said yeah was pre training using a more general architecture pre training on a lot of data and then all the symmetries are just learned from data from data generation data augmentation from like various noising objectives, and there's a lot of advantages to that. So is this, was this gone wide or is this? Uh... So, so the foundation of that is from social biology is new, it's a hard to pick new. I, I assume people are working, other people are working this now. Um, my main counter argument for what you suggest is scarcity data, basically. Unlike images or text, where you have like billions of examples, there's only like, you know, in grand total, something like 200,000 experiments that we can start. But you said there's like hundreds of millions, in the beginning there were like hundreds of millions of things. The Vida model, right. But, um, I mean, you can use them for noising or something like that. It could be like people have shown these, uh, they, they pre train and these, and then find children, and they just start to make sure they can do it. But um, it's not clear whether it's good enough. So, so but they, you know, I can it's a general point, right? They should use more of a um, more generic genetic bias with the like, like consumer versus the individual. I understand the point. It's unclear. And uh, the second was like more technical, I guess. So in your particular architecture, like the only kind of like global operation was this pooling thing, right? Like yes. So like if you have like more complex interactions that are far away from one another on the sequence, this is. Is this like not needed or not captured? Or so, so there's no like multiple layers of like message passing, right? It's like, yeah, it's a good question. So it's not always clear how many layers you need. Like, you know, um, basically, in this case, there was like one layer for this chain. Um, perhaps you need more, you can do better with more, but it's like, it's not, I don't believe it's obvious. Like, there are examples, but the case of sequence modeling. Uh, this shallow classic goes from architecture actually goes better than like the deep variation that we don't know. Like sometimes, does that mean that things are very local? Like that prediction is like kind of local? Yeah, uh, but you know, there's no not enough data to you know accommodate not to scale. Of course, mine is not but I mean, funding. It's not faulty, but that's the fault. Yeah. But but here we're almost talking about the binding sites. That's not the yes, yeah. 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 Why not? Is it is it 